Good evening, everyone. Shavua Tov. In the name of the Kahal Kadosh, we'd like to welcome Rabbi David Asher, that flew in specially from Brooklyn, New York, to be with us tonight on a very special night, right the first week of the month of Adar. We kindly ask the Kahal Kadosh to make sure to have the cell phones in silent or in vibrate. This way it does not disturb the video taping as well as the audio recording for tonight's class. Tonight's class was generously sponsored by the Hillary family, the Ayun Nishmat, Yaakov and Miriam Hillary Alav Shalom, as well as anonymous sponsorship for the Refuah Shalema of David Menachem Ben Devorah Le'ah, Shiduch for the Hamadina Bat Hanabatia, and by the Shem, by the Hazan and the Tesh family, the Refuah Shalema, the beloved father, Sion Ben Sarah, May Hashem give him refuah shelema among the Cholim of Am Israel, Mr. Leon Betesh, that unfortunately has been in the hospital for the past few weeks. So, as at Hashem, and we hope that the support of tonight's lecture will be a benefit for everyone, those that are physically needed or those that are spiritually uh, needed as well. Tonight's program is, I would like to say, the soft opening for the upcoming Ladies Midrashah at the Safar Synagogue, which will be named the Chovita Kohav Ladies Midrashah. Many of you remember that in the past few years, we did have an ongoing ladies program for ladies only on a Monday night. And then we took a sabbatical for many technical reasons. And as at Hashem, we're relaunching the program now. And Rabbi David Asher is honored to be actually our first speaker of this new season of the Midrasha. Although it's a ladies Midrasha, but occasionally when we have a specific and wonderful speakers that we feel comfortable enough to say that the men's department and the ladies department will benefit, we definitely take the advantage to be Mehazek the Torah for the Kahal. This is the reason why you will be seeing a flyer that is obviously more feminine colors featuring the next speakers for the remaining part of the month. On Monday, February 18th, will be Rabbi Koskas from Surfside, and Monday, February 25th, will be Rabbi Frank Shapiro from North Miami Beach. And we are already planning on the march that we're going to have great speakers coming up for the benefit of the Kahal. On a personal note, every Shabbat for the past three or four years, and the rabbi may not know this, I spend Shabbat with the rabbi, remotely. We know that part of the beauty of the Shabbat table is to say the Torah on the Shabbat table. As my wife tells me, Yosef, what are you going to tell me tonight? So I said, you know what? I'm going to let the rabbi do the talking. And every Shabbat meal, Shabbat dinner, Shabbat lunch will read the living emunah. Wow. The one that you wrote, and Baruch Hashem, we made siyum of two volumes, and we already started volume number three. So I will tell you, Rabbi, as a humble follower of yours, you know, you may be in Brooklyn, but I hear you every Shabbat on my Shabbat table. The Rabbi, it's not appropriate to praise the Rabbi or to praise anyone so much publicly, but no one can deny that the Living Emunah audio file that is being sent daily and the book, the hardcover paper book I showed with the rabbi a while back that since the Bar Mitzvah, we have Bar Mitzvahs in the synagogue, to all the boys we give the Living Emunah for teens. And in the day of Simchat Torah, we gave the living emunah for children. Remember, we gave the living emunah. Why? Because today, without emunah, I don't think that we can survive. I don't think that we can function. Not only as Yehudim, but even as humans. But we have the master teacher of emunah tonight with us. So at this moment, I'd like to welcome Rabbi David Asher to give us words of Hizuk. The topic of tonight will be emunah and Shalom Bayit, the perfect formula. Please welcome Rabbi David Asher.
Okay, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I feel very at home here, seeing all the familiar faces. I was very excited to come here, especially since it's 30 degrees in Brooklyn now. <laughs> but every time the Rabbi comes to deal, he wows us with his deep insight, his warmth, his love. It's, uh, it's really the inspiration that I got just from being here today, seeing the community and hearing about the ta'anit that went on today. We have a lot to learn from you. And uh, I'm going to, God willing, go back and tell our community, why aren't we fasting on Shogadim? But really, it's a, uh, I have the privilege of having the rabbi's daughter in my class in Brooklyn. She's the best student in the class by far, sits in the front row, diligent, takes notes. Our Berkat Yadiyot is that the rabbi and the kahal continue growing. Mechayel al amen. So I was asked to speak about Emunah and Shalom Bayi. Emunah is just about bringing Hashem more into your life. The Gemara says, Everything that happens to us is from heaven, except for the way we react between good and bad. Everything else is set up by Hashem. Hashem puts us in the circumstances we need to be in to fulfill our roles and our missions in life. The Gemara tells us, Me Hashem Isha Ish. That marriages are made in heaven, as we know. So I saw a question from the Sefer Bayat He says, doesn't the Gemara say everything's from heaven? What do you mean marriage is from heaven? Everything's from heaven. So he says, yeah, everything's from heaven. But when it comes to marriage, God reveals himself even more. He shows us his active role, how clear it is. When you see couples coming together, all the stories, how this one met that one. I read a story this past year about a girl from Israel. She said she was the last girl in her class to not be married, still not married. She was getting on in years 25, 26, 27. She's seeing everyone around her have a family, children, and she's still alone. And every day she's moping to her mother, when am I going to get married? And. She couldn't have, she couldn't find Simcha in her life. One day her mother comes home, now she said she's 29. Her mother comes home and says, Tonight's the big auction in the shul, I'm going to take you to the auction, we're going to have a great time. She says, Ma, I don't want to go to the auction. She says, No, you'll have fun, we'll put in a lot of coupons, I'll let you put in whatever you want, I don't really want to go. She said, Go for me. She says, Okay, for you I'll go. She says, Don't worry, we're going to have a good time. They get to the auction, they're putting in for all the prizes, they stay till the end, and they're calling out the grand prize, an all-expense-paid trip to Europe, and who wins? This girl. She wins the raffle. So her mother says, no, oh, we're, so, we're so excited, you won the raffle. She says, Ma, why do I want to go to Europe? What am I going to go alone? She says, no, I'm going to take you, we're going to have the best time, it's going to be great. Finally, the day comes, they go on this trip, they get to the first stop, is in Hungary, and they saw another group touring there, a large Jewish group. They said, why should we go alone? Let's tag on to their group. They asked if they could come along. They said, no problem. And this girl, she's sitting on the bus next to a woman, and the woman makes conversation. And by the end of the day, the girl comes back to her mother and says, Ma, I'm sitting next to a woman today, she's the most, I love her. She has such good qualities, good me dog, she's talking, she lifts me up, she's so bubbly and great. She says, I'm really enjoying it, I, want, I can't wait for tomorrow, I'm so happy we came. The next day they go back on the trip, she's talking to this woman, and this woman mentions she has a 30 year old son. She says, Ma, if he's half, well, anything that she is, I want to marry him. He says, who are they? We don't know them. We're this, that. 
they find out their names, they make phone calls, and in the end, they start dating, and the girl telling the story now, she says, I'm now 42, I married that man, we have four or five kids, and she says, to, to believe, I'm going to find my shiduch, winning the auction, flying to Europe, meeting another guy from the mother. This is the Yad Hashem. Now Hashem, when the time comes, you'll find the girl, you'll find the guy, wherever they are, Hashem knows how to bring us there. The Zohar HaKadosh teaches us. We know every soul, when it comes down into the world, it's divided into two. And Hashem, who is the Mezaveg Zivugim, He lets the souls, He makes the souls reunite. The Zohar has a question. He says, what if the soulmate doesn't really match up with the other soulmate. Why? He says, because one became very religious and one is not so religious. What will Hashem do then when the souls don't match? See, so he says, first, Hashem will give an awakening to the soul that's not there yet, to the person. He'll try to encourage them to become better. A rabbi told me from one of my friends, he said he was 26 not married, he's going out for five years, he can't find anyone. He said he went on this massive praying campaign, he went to the hotel for 40 days. He said one year later, he met his bride-to-be. He said, you know where she was last year? Last year she was in public high school. And that time that I was praying, she told her mother at the end of high school, I want to go next year to Israel, the seminary. Mother said, what? You seminary? Where, 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 from where to where? She says, I want to go, I have a friend going. And she became religious over that year, and she married the rabbi. Mm -hmm. So Hashem will send an awakening, and if the person answers it, great. But what if not? Says the Zohar, don't worry, there's a backup plan. Hashem has a second zivug sheni that can match up with you according to your deeds. He says Hashem will make a match. You had one soul like this, one soul like this, you had another pair like that, and He'll make the matches that fits you perfectly. And He says the moment the man puts the ring on the, ring on the finger, their souls unite as one, and they definitely met the right person, you found your zivu, whether it's zivu Rishon, zivu Sheni, it doesn't matter. You found the right zivu for you. And it's very important in marriage to know you married the right one. Because when you have doubts, that's the evil inclination trying to ruin the marriage. Maybe I could have done better. The young generation now, that's what they keep thinking, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I should have, maybe I should have done this, maybe I should have done that. I once read an article about a, that was written by a Remington. She said that, she said that a, a girl came to her and said, I'm having shalom bayat problems, I, I think I might have married the wrong guy, what should I do? So the Rebetzin said, I want to tell you a short story. She said there was an incident once with a woman, another woman from my community. And she traveled to Israel to talk to a great rabbi. And when she was with the rabbi, the rabbi asked her who she is. He asked her about her family. And she said, I have two sons and a daughter who was killed in a car accident five years ago. She would have been 10 years old now. The gentle rabbi told her in a soft voice, please don't think like that. Your child would not have been 10 years old. She was not meant to reach that age. She was sent down to the world by a purposeful creator whose plan was that she be here for the five years that she lived. This is the way it was meant to be. That woman said, that young mother later said, I felt so comforted 
with those words. I was able to move on hearing that. The Rebetzin continued, My dear student, when you chose your husband to become your life partner, you did so for a good reason, with the best judgment and resources available to you at that time. Hashem brought you this person, He put him in front of you, He put you in that circumstance with all that information that led you to say yes, because that's the person He wanted you to marry. There is nobody else out there for you. This is the right one. And this girl went on to say that her marriage improved when she, when she realized that. I have the right one. We give a blessing to the Khatan and Kala at their marriage. They should be like Adam and Haba in Gan Eden. The blessing is you should know with the clarity you got the right one, just like Adam and Haba. There was no one else in the world. Of course they got the right one. That's how we're supposed to look at our spouses. There's nobody else in the world. There's only me and you. I saw this past summer a midrash. It was an eye-opening midrash for me. I, could, I tried to find it again. I couldn't get the exact address. I saw it quoted in another book. The midrash was discussing different reasons for why Hashem wants us to get married. So one of the reasons is because we are meant to emulate Hashem. How do we emulate Hashem? It says, just like Hashem bestows kindness upon His creations, expecting nothing in return, that is how we are supposed to act. And He wants us to choose a partner where we could spend our lives practicing this. Giving, expecting nothing back. Because Hashem doesn't expect anything back from us. The mitzvot that we do are for us. He doesn't need us. He is all complete. He is all powerful. But the mitzvot that we do benefit us. And this is the attitude we're supposed to have in a marriage. What can I do for my spouse? and get nothing back. A lot of times, I deal sometimes with the younger couples with Shalom Bayek issues and they're talking about, they don't appreciate what I do, she doesn't appreciate, he doesn't appreciate. Of course, you're supposed to appreciate. You're supposed to say thank you. But if you didn't get the thank you, say, I'm not really doing it for a thank you. I'm emulating my God. My God gives expecting nothing in return, that's how I give. And if you didn't get the thank you, you say, Hashem, I did it for you. There was a story once, I put it in one of the books, Rabbi, you might have heard this one. <laughs> it was about the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim said, or his son-in-law said, he was once working with his father-in-law on a question, a deep halachic question. We know the Chafetz Chaim authored a colossal work called Mishnah ben Ura. It's a halakha book that studied across the globe. And they spent one time on one question, three days, discussing until, excuse me, they got to the bottom of it. And after they finished, the Chafetz Chaim put in the book two lines. So his son-in-law said, Dad, we spent three days on this. Is anyone who reads this book going to appreciate your toil? You spent three days, it's only in two lines. No one's going to appreciate what you did. So the Chafetz Chaim said, let me tell you a story. I once overheard there was a father and a son talking as they were laying the railroad tracks for the Tsar of Russia. And they woke up early every morning, back-breaking labor. They were there till night, freezing cold. So he said, I once heard the son asking the father, he said the same question. He says, Dad, is anyone riding this railroad ever going to appreciate our work? I think they're going to know. They're just be going on the train. They're not going to know the sweat we put into this. 
So the father said, it doesn't matter what anybody knows, we are working for the czar, and the czar knows what we do, and that's all that counts. And the Chafetz Chaim said, I took a deep lesson from him. In life, we're working for the boss, we're working for God. It doesn't matter if anybody knows how much time I spent on this question, or how many hours I spent on that, because the boss knows, and he's the only one that matters. And this is the attitude we are supposed to have in our marriages. Someone told me, he said, you know how much pleasure he gets? He wakes up early in the morning, and he knows how meticulous his wife is with the house. He says sometimes the children, after his wife goes to sleep, they make a little mess in the kitchen, they make a mess here, they make a mess there, and she doesn't even know about it. He says, before I go to shul, I clean up the mess. I don't even tell her. I do it because I want to bestow kindness upon my wife. I'm not looking for appreciation. I'm not looking for a thank you. I'm looking to do, to emulate my Creator. It's a beautiful thing. Whenever we work for anything, sometimes people, they make parties, they make sheba berachot, and the couple comes in late and leaves early and they don't say thank you. We spend weeks, they don't even say thank you. At that moment, say, I, I'm emulating God. I'm bestowing kindness upon people because that's what God wanted. He saw what I did and that's enough. Emunah in marriage. The rabbis tell us, Chavot Levavot and many others, when somebody affects us in life, whether negative, negatively or positively, we look at them as messengers of Hashem. We say, that's what Hashem wanted from, from me now. Kapara na'avonot. I'm not holding him or her responsible. It's what God wanted. Like David Melech said, when Shem'i ben Gera was cursing him, his, his men said, David, should we kill him? You're the king. He said, leave him alone. Hashem amar lo kilel. Hashem told him to do it. That's how we look at people who affect us, whether negatively or negatively. When David HaMelech said that, he got so elevated, he became the fourth leg of God's chariot in heaven. Rabbi Shimshon Pinkes said, we should use the same thought process in our marriages. The people that we know the most, the people we're closest to. If someone said something hurtful, we say, Hashem, I must have needed that now. Kapara. If a man comes home and the house is flying and his wife's not ready for him and she's not even paying attention, the man can blow a fuse. You know, I worked all day, I came home, at least we... the man should say to himself, Me'et Hashem. I was meant to come home tonight and not have dinner right away ready, and that's it. And God, I accept it. And say a nice word, hello, honey. And whenever she's ready, just eat. And if the wife spent a long time preparing dinner, and the husband walks in an hour late, and the food is cold, and he said, sorry, I have a business meeting, he says, what? Say, Me'et Hashem. It was meant to be like this. Does that mean I should be a pushover and just take insult by my wife? Of course not. Once something happened, me'et Hashem. Going forward, we make our best efforts <coughs> to do what we think is proper, to have, to do what we think is going to make us happy. Of course we're allowed and we're so encouraged to speak to our spouses when they do things we don't like. But we have to be very careful to do it in the right way. Because this could be the difference between a happy marriage and a not happy marriage. People don't like being corrected. Once you say something against someone else, they put their guard up and they start lashing back. There's a way to do it. They said there was a story with the great Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach. 
By his wife's funeral, he said in a low voice, it's customary for the husband to ask forgiveness from his wife before they part. He says, I don't really need to ask you forgiveness. There's nothing that I did to ever upset you. But I'm just going to ask you because it's customary. He said it low. A few people next to him heard it. So one of his students later said, did you agree with everything in life? How could you never do something to upset her? How is that possible? He said, we disagreed on a lot of issues. He said, but whenever I told her something, before I corrected her, or I told her the way I felt, I didn't do it on the spot. I waited a little. I complimented her ten times. And then when I said it, I didn't say it at her. I said it about me. Meaning, let's say for example, the food was bland. I would say, I like a lot of salt in my food. Instead of saying, why don't you put anything in the food? I put it on me. I like it that way. And after I said that, I complimented her again. And this way, people are able to bear what you're telling them, and they'll do it because they see you doing it out of love to enhance the relationship. It's very important to communicate. Because when people keep things bottled up inside, Somebody, you know, someone told me, he said he wanted to go to his parents' house for Shabbat. She wanted to go to her parents' house. Whatever happened, and they ended up going to her, but it bothered him. And then, he didn't tell her how much it bothered him. But the next time she wanted something, he held it back. So I got her back now. And then, she says, he's getting me, I'm getting... And it just escalated from nothing. Because you didn't tell her. Why don't you talk to her and say, you know, it bothered me that you didn't want to go to my parents. And say it in a nice way and communicate instead of keeping things bottled inside and taking revenge. It is so important to talk. Talk, say what's on your mind, but do it in the right way. The greatness of a person is that when they want to correct someone, they build them up. They make them feel better, and then they act better. We know we had a great prophetess, Devorah. She was the leader of the Jewish people. She had a husband who was like an Amahite. I don't know exactly all the details, but he wasn't a scholar. So what did she do? She built him up. She used to make wicks for the Beit HaMikdash, and she sent him to bring them and say, go hang out of the Beit HaMikdash, bring the wicks for the Menorah. And she made her husband feel important. A great woman can, as they say, behind every great man is a great woman. It's a million percent true. Because a man cannot be great without a woman behind him, making him feel great. The difference between the way we correct someone could destroy them or can make them great. I want to share with you a story that I read this past week. A rabbi tells, it was in a book, I forgot the name of the book, something from For the Heart. A rabbi tells, there was a, there's a man, young man in LA, his name is Jason. Jason from LA, when he was 17 years old, had zero religion. He had long hair, earrings, he didn't look like a Jew. But he said about himself, and I heard afterwards this Jason talking about himself after I read the story, I found him on the internet. He said, I, I was still spiritual, I kept nothing, but I was still spiritual, I had a connection to God. He said, one night I was driving home from my auto body shop, he must have dropped out of high school, he had an auto body shop at 17. And he said, Friday night, I decided I wanted to stop and pray in the Persian shul. He's Persian. He parks his car down the block. He walks into the back of the shul, and he sits down. He's not even wearing a kippah. He takes out a sidur. He's reading the English. And he spent a good half hour, 45 minutes, connecting to God. He said, I felt good. I liked it. 
He got back into his car, he drove to whatever he did that night, and he said, I want to do this again next week. And he did this three consecutive weeks. On the fourth week, again, he's sitting there in the back of the shul. This time, an older man approaches him and says, what are you doing here? You don't belong in this shul. Look how you're dressed. How do you walk into a synagogue like that? You're not even wearing a kippah. Look at your hair, wearing earring. You don't belong here. He said, I'm so ashamed. He's talking loud, embarrassed me. He said, I was frozen. And he said, what are you doing? I told you to leave. He said, I stood up. I said, that's it, I'm out of here. And then another man said, wait a minute, sit back down. And he told the first man, he said, what is he doing here? He says, you know I have a son that looks just like him? You know where he is right now? He's in a club, partying. This man decides to come to a shul and talk to his God? And you tell him he doesn't belong? This guy is amazing. He could do anything now, and he's coming to talk to Hashem. He is great. Continue praying. He said, Jason, he said, I felt great after he said that. He really lifted me up. I felt like a person, like I belonged. He says, I went home that night, and I opened up a Tanakh. I haven't opened it. He had a Tanakh in his house since third grade. He started reading Parashat Bereshit. Got inspired. This boy realized he has a photographic memory. He starts reading Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Amidbar, Devarim. He went through the entire Tanakh. This was not at 17. He went home, he started at 17. This took a couple of years. Maybe he was in his 20s when he, by the time he did this. But it said, he said, I mastered the whole Tanakh and I felt unbelievable. He said, I'm sitting in my auto body shop one day and a priest walks in and he starts convincing me that Judaism is false. And he says, why don't you start coming to Yeshu and he died for you? How could you not serve him? He says, what do you mean he died for me? It says in uh, Deuteronomy 26, 16, that a man shall not die for the sins of his... He says, what? And he's quoting Tanakh, Pesukim. He said the priest had nothing to say. He walked out of it. His friends heard about this. His friends heard that he put this priest to shame. And they said, we're in a college campus. And there's a missionary who comes constantly telling us, Jews for Yeshu, Jews for Yeshu. And we don't know what to tell him. Could you debate him for us? He says, me? I can debate him? I don't know anything. He says, please, come debate him. He says, I don't know, I don't know. Okay. And if you want to watch this debate, it's on the floor. It's on the internet. Something Jews for Yeshu debate with a Persian Jew. I've got the exact, the exact uh, address. He gets up. And for one full hour or longer, he's quoting left and right, Jeremiah, this pasuk, that pasuk. He made the guy look so silly. And the people in the crowd ended up being hundreds of people that made over a hundred people. They told him after, I believe more in Hashem because of that speech that you just gave today. And now a hundred and 20,000 people have watched that video. How many Jews has this guy affected? All because of one person building him up. You could have put him down and said, you're nothing, you don't belong here, get out of here. You could say, look at you, you're great. You have potential, you're coming to talk to your God. You're a great person. This is how we build people. And this is how couples have to build each other. Look at the fine points, the goodness. Tell him how good he is. Tell her how great she is. You can't imagine how far a compliment goes. When you treat someone like a king, he acts like a king. 
how when you treat someone like a queen, she acts like a queen. Chazal tell us, Ish ve'ishto shezachu shechina b'nehem. A man and woman who merit to have peace in the home, merit to have God dwelling in their home, in their house. How do we merit? By putting our spouse on a pedestal, by making them feel special. You see, marriage is a mitzvah like any other. We have to do this mitzvah behidur, the best way. A man wants to do lulav and etrog the best way, get the best tefillin, get the best marriage. Fulfill your mitzvah of marriage the best way. The ladies, they're so spiritual, they always are yearning for greatness. Work hard on being the best wife so you can have the best shalom by it. I read a story about the great Rabbi Eliyahu Desler, who wrote the Mechtag Eliyahu. His entire life, he had a Kiddush cup that he used. It was a smaller type of Kiddush cup, and according to most rabbis, it fit the minimum requirement of how much wine you need for Kiddush. There was one opinion, the Chazon Ish, strict rabbi, who required the cup to be bigger, and most of the rabbis try to adhere to the Chazon Ish's opinion. But this rabbi, Desna, he had a small cup. After his wife passed away, he switched to the bigger cup. So someone was by his house and rabbi, for years, he using that cup, why'd you switch? He said, you know how much I love the Chazon Ish, I like to follow all of his stringencies. He said, but that first cup, my father-in-law gave it to me at our wedding. And I knew how much my wife would appreciate if I used that cup. It's more important to make my wife feel good than to get that extra stringency of the chazonish. So for all those years, I used that cup. But after she passed on, then I switched to the Chazon Ish's cup. I saw something fascinating this past week as I was preparing for this class. Like every mitzvah, you need preparation before you do it. You have to know how to shake a lulav and etrog before you do it. You have to know how to put on tefili. Every mitzvah, we need to learn how to do it. Marriage, besides for the laws of Taharat HaMishpacha, a man and a woman, it said in this sefer, if you want to do the mitzvah the right way, you're obligated to understand the psychology of each other. You have to know the psychology of men and the psychology of women. How do you expect to succeed if you don't know the women's needs or the men's needs? So we have the Rambam in Hilchot Ishut. He gives us six pieces of advice of how a man is supposed to act with his spouse and six pieces of advice of how a woman is supposed to act with her spouse. And you'll see in the Rambam how he knows the deep psychology of each of men and women, and he accounts for them in his, in his advice over here. I would like to go through it a little bit, and maybe we can learn something. The Rambam begins, our rabbis have taught us, we'll start with the man. A man has to honor his wife more than he honors himself. He has to be mechabed, give kabod to his wife more than he gives himself. What does this mean? So some of the things of kabod, the Gemara says our clothing give us kabod. A man cannot say, well, I don't care what I wear, so you just wear this also. You can't say that. 
Because a woman is much more sensitive in clothing than a man is. She's much more sensitive to appearance. You cannot put her, put her on the same standard as you. Because God made her differently. So you have to honor her more than you honor herself, than yourself. She's very particular about the house, about how the house appears. That's her honor. You have to give in in those areas. Because the woman is more sensitive in those areas. You have to love your wife. Like yourself. Love your wife like yourself. You have a need. A man has a need. He takes care of that need. Whatever it is, he'll go and take care. If his wife asks him to do something, he has to value her statement at least as much as he would for himself. To be able to fulfill this, to fulfill your wife's needs, you have to know what your wife needs. I was listening the other day to a rabbi he was talking about some psychology of women. He said, if a man doesn't know the code language of his wife, he's finished. A woman says to her husband, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. So a husband, a genius husband, sizes up her statement as a psychologist, and he says, you're tired? Why don't you just go to sleep early? This guy's a genius. You figured it out. She said she's tired. And you told her to go to sleep. Exactly. When a woman says she's tired, a woman wants her husband to say, Oh, you must have had such a hard day today. You must have had so many, oh, you had that errand, and you went here, and you did that, and you were busy with the chesed, and you had that big sale. You must be exhausted. And then she'll say, no, no, I'm not that tired, I'm not that tired. <laughs> because you acknowledged what she wanted you to acknowledge. You have to give her the attention she wants. A greater genius of a husband says, why are you so tired? Ah, you're not so tired. Huh? What'd you do all day? <laughs> X, double X. You failed. You have a mitzvah of shalom by it. Give the woman what she needs. When she says a statement like that, that's what she needs. A woman... Tell me if I'm wrong, ladies. The woman, she doesn't look like she's having, she looks a little sad. So her husband says, what's wrong, honey? Oh, nothing. <laughs> if he says, okay. <laughs> what do you mean, okay? She's waiting for you. Please tell me, what's bothering you? I need to hear, I want to help you. Maybe I can help you. She's waiting for you. Ladies, that's their nature, they're born like that. They talk in hint form. They're not gonna ask you to help them. But if they see you sitting on the couch reading the paper, while they're toiling in the kitchen, and you don't offer your help, they're gonna... But they're not gonna ask. Now, for better shalom by it, we talk to both. It's incumbent on the lady, if she sees her husband is not responding, to have to be more clear. Tell him what's bothering you. Tell him why you're tired. Tell him what's bothering you. Because if you're just going to wait, the feelings are going to get, the negativity is going to escalate. Release it. Tell him. And you'll have a habit. So it goes both ways. Sometimes the woman has to be more clear, and sometimes the husband's just got to get it. The next thing he says, the Rambam, in yesh lo mamon, if the man has money, marbe betovata kefi mamon. Keep 
a lot of it upon her according to your means. Money is a very big issue in Shalom Bayi. Very big issue. We need a lot of chizuk when it comes to money. This week's parasha, I read something astonishing. The Jewish people were asked by Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem told Moshe, V'yikhu li terumah. Daber el b'nei Yisrael, V'yikhu li terumah. I saw the Baal HaTurim, he says from the words, by Daber al-Lev, he says something with the word Lev, I forgot the exact quote, that Hashem was telling Moshe, appease them to give. Talk to them nicely so that they donate to my house. And one of the rabbis said, talk to them nicely to donate? Hashem just gave them billions of dollars. They left Egypt with the wealth of Mitzrayim. It says each Jew had 90 donkey loads worth of money. When Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem, the Mishkan is very expensive. Hashem told them, each Jew has enough money to build the whole temple on his own. That's how much money they had. And every day Hashem sent down jewels in the man. They were getting more money. Every day go out in the man, more money, more money. What were their expenses in the desert? No tuition. There was no house, no rent, no food, no clothing and grew with them. No cars. No insurance. What did they need money for in the desert? But Hashem told Moshe, you have to ask them nicely. Because once a dollar gets into someone's pocket, it's mine, it's mine. They forget about Hashem, they forget about everything. My hard earned money, it's hard to part with it. So we need chizuk when it comes to spending money. The Gemara talks about the great virtue of somebody who was able to spend money. It says, Iyob was a vateran bemamono. He spent his money easily. And because of that, he was blessed. He was blessed. Before he had all the salat, he, had, he was very wealthy because he was a vateran with his money. If a man does not have the money, a lady has to understand money is from God. Hashem decides how much, when He's bringing it, when He's not bringing it. It has nothing to do with the husband. He's not a lazy good for nothing if He's not bringing money home. It's because Hashem decided you're not getting money now and that's it. And you're both in it together. The man and the wife together. It's decided by God if you're getting money. It's not on the husband. And in actuality, the Gemara says the blessing comes to the home and the merit of the lady. The lady brings the blessing. If a man has blessing, it's only because of his wife. That's why he has blessing. So we have to know we're in it together. When you have, great. If you don't have, you have to cut down. You have to make sure you spend the right way. But if someone has, if a lady has a need, the husband must spend on her. Bismha. You have to spend happily. You're going to spend it anyway. Don't do it begrudgingly. A woman gets a new pair of shoes. The husband should say, they look gorgeous on you. I hope you enjoy them. I love seeing you in new clothes. If you can afford it. Whatever it is, to be able to spend if you have it is a great midah. And again, if he doesn't have it, you have to understand, you can't spend. But if he has it, I'll never forget, you know, you remember things when people are, are spenders. Even though some people are not the wealthiest people, but you see the way they spend, it makes an impression on you. I once went, we had a siyum. There are 20 people at a restaurant, and we were supposed to split the bill at the end. And everyone's ordering steaks and this and that. You know, we're all splitting it. At the end of this, at the siyum, I can't imagine how big this bill was. They tell us, don't worry, it was all paid for. 
Who paid for it? One guy there. He said, Satan, everybody, I hope you enjoy. He wasn't so wealthy. But he's, he's able to spend. My friends were going out for a seal. It's on me. Enjoy it. It's a great midah. You have it? Spend it. That's what God gave it to you for. So, the Rambam is telling us the third thing, we have to be able to spend money if we have. The next piece of advice he gives us, he says, a man should not instill too much fear in the house. You cannot, the Gemara talks about a woman who husband instilled so much fear in her, she had a non-kosher piece of meat for dinner. She got the wrong one, but she was afraid. The rage her husband would go into, if dinner wasn't ready, she was ready to serve it to him. Because she was scared. You can't instill fear. It's not a way to live. The Rambam says further, he says, Talk to her softly. A man and a woman are not the same. If a man and a woman are having an argument and they're both raising their voices, the woman feels it a hundred times more. She's much more sensitive than the man. And a man has to know that. The tears of the woman are easily, they easily, they come easily. It's not a fair fight. You have to speak the nahat softly. You'll get much further in life if you're speaking soft. You should not be you should not be said. You should not be said. A woman when she sees her husband said, she thinks it's her fault. Why is my husband not happy? And this goes both ways. A husband doesn't want to see his wife said. It's a reflection. He says, What am I doing wrong? We're supposed to be happy. The Gibaradi, it does say Yosef, when he had the dream, he called his father Yaakov the sun and his mother Rachel the moon. It says a woman in general is a reflection of the man. When the man is happy and the man is, the woman will get lifted up with him. But the way we're supposed to live, both of us, Happily, something's bothering you, get it off your chest and move on. But we have to be bismha all the time. The Lord of Zan, the lesson is you can't be angry. A man by nature has a temper. A man wants to show how macho he is. And lo aleno, I hear stories of young couples where the man is saying, despicable words to his wife in rage. And Munah will help us so much. Talk softly. Be happy. It's man Hashem. Uh, someone came over to me this past Shabbat and said, I'm so proud of my wife. She gets agitated a lot with the children. The children do this, that. So he said, my, she's working on Emunah. She's reading Emunah, listening to Emunah. He said, my little son, he threw all the expensive china dish on the floor and it cracked. I was so nervous what my wife's going to do. She did nothing. She didn't flinch. She said, Meh Hashem. She was quiet. He said, I was so proud of her. What a way to live. You're getting rewarded for your child breaking the dish if you're able to say it's from Hashem. This is the way we're supposed to live. And the Rambam tells us about the lady. The lady has to be mechabed, her husband. You have to honor your husband. You want to be die. More a lot. What does that mean? It says, as much honor as you think you're giving your husband, you have to do more. You have to make him honor. Husbands need their wives to tell them, you're good, you're okay. He comes home, had a terrible day at the office, nobody likes you, you're great. Somebody said he was in a basketball league and he messed up the fourth quarter. They were up by how many? I don't know what it was. And he missed 20 shots and he lost the finals for his team. He said, I couldn't have played worse. I ruined the whole season. 
He said, when I was in the car on the way home, my wife said, no, it's not so bad. You almost hit the shot. You this, you that. He said, I know she was lying, but I felt better. I felt better. You're not so bad. It's not so bad. Don't think, don't worry. Nobody saw you. Don't worry. Nobody, nobody knows. It's okay. Lift up your husband. Honor him. A, a man needs honor from his wife. It says she's supposed to fear him. She's supposed to do everything by his mouth. That means you want to do something, check with your husband. Honey, is it okay? Can I do that? Can I spend on this? Can I do this? Can I do that? Make him the leader. Let him be the leader of the household like he's supposed to be. A husband has to be in his wife's eyes like a king. Like you're talking to a king. And she has to do everything. Whatever he wants. What's a kosher wife? Who does it? It's son ba'ala. What my husband wants. Whatever my husband wants. It's a great wife. And he says, and she distances from him anything he hates. I'm saying very brief, because we don't have so much time. Each one of these is a class on its own. How? The chidush I got is you have to learn what a person needs to have a successful marriage. If you don't know and you're having issues, you go to a counselor, to a rabbi, and say, what am I doing wrong? How can I correct it? How can I fix it? Communication. Tefillah. Prayer is so important. To pray to Hashem for the well-being of your shalom by it. Let my husband Hashem have love for me. Let me love him. All these feelings that we want. You could ask Hashem even to put something in somebody's heart. You can say, Hashem, let my husband show his love for me more. Or vice versa. Anything you want, you can ask Hashem for. And he's listening. And he wants to help you. Use him. Use him for your shalom by it. It's very important as well to have a rabbi. Because sometimes you get into a struggle and you have a stalemate. What do we do now? This side says this way, that side says that way. We can't come to a conclusion. If you have somebody that you both trust, let's ask the rabbi. The rabbi will be the one to make this decision. It will solve a lot of problems. It's a very big, it's important. It's important to have a family rabbi that we discuss not only halakha, other things as well, including personal issues. I want to tell you a story. It's more of an emunah story, just happened. But it also includes shalom bayit, so I can say it. The story of a young rabbi, he lives in New Jersey, and he commutes every day to Brooklyn, and he teaches in one of the yeshivot in Brooklyn. And he drives back and forth with a carpool, whatever it is, and he's, he, he earns a living from it being a teacher. He told me at night he needs to supplement, his income is not enough as a teacher. He needed a second job. He makes phone calls for a certain institution, and he makes um, five days a week, he makes phone calls for maybe an hour and a half a night, two hours a night, and he said that pays, that pays me $1,500 a month, and I use that for my, for my, uh, my, my mortgage. His mortgage is $3,000 a month, he has a two family, he gets $1,000 rent, plus that $1,500, I'm sorry, it's 1100 rent plus the 50, whatever, I'm not sure the exact numbers. And he finagles, he gets the last four or 500 every month. And his rebbe job pays for all the other expenses. 
He said on November 28th, his night job tells him, we don't need you anymore. Uh, sorry, we're finished. Finished? But I don't have any, how am I going to make my, my, pay my mortgage, my rent, my this? Sorry, that's it. See, he tells his wife, he says, honey, he says, you know, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. You know how badly I wanted to learn more Torah? I was aching to learn at night. I used to learn at night two, two and a half hours. Maybe this is Hashem giving me an opportunity to go back to learning at night two hours. I think I can do great. She said, what are you talking about? What about the money? How are you going to pay? He said, I'm learning in Mona so much. I know Hashem can take care of me, even without the job. She says, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. She says, I don't you have to make an ishtadut. I love He says, no, people who have so much emunah, that Hashem can take care of them. So they, she said, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm worried. I'm nervous. So she tells him, and they have a family rabbi. She says, you know what? You ask the rabbi. Whatever the rabbi says, I'm good with. And that's the Shalom Bayi. Instead of arguing, she says, go ask the rabbi. Let me see what he says. So he calls up his rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, I'm telling you, I have him now. Could I go learn? And Hashem will send me the money. So his rabbi says, this question is beyond me. I can't answer this one. I don't know. Can you do it? Can I tell you, no, don't have that one I tell you, I don't know. He said, but there's a great rabbi from Israel, Rosh Yeshiva. He happens to be in town for two days. And I'm connected. I can get in touch with him. I'm going to ask the great rabbi from Israel your question. He says, great. He gets in contact with him. He said it was 12.30 at night. The rabbi gets on the phone with him. And he starts telling the rabbi, now this, this, uh, he's telling the rabbi about this boy, he's sitting next to him. He said, he said he has been to Ahon and Hashem and Munah, Hashem can take care of him. So the rabbi starts saying, you don't know what Hashem wants from you. Maybe you still need to work, you can't guarantee this, that. You need to make a Hishnah. He told him, you can't be, uh, you know, God wants us to make a Hishnah to earn a living. You have to do something that makes sense. He says, although there is a concept of a person who has total emunah, and he really believes there's a concept. You can be taken care of like that. I don't know if you really have that or not. If you do, who am I to stop you? He says to, to the rabbi, give him a three-month trial. If he's that guy who has emunah, and Vitahon and he's relying on Hashem, he'll get the money. If not, you're obligated to find a new job. So the boy tells me, this young rabbi, he's a rabbi, he says to me, he says, I felt great. Three month trial. Me and Hashem. See, he says, we started now, it was December 1st. Was, uh, this was, by the time he had the meeting of the first day of December, he has till January to collect the $3,000 for his mortgage. Again, he's getting $1,100 from, uh, from the thing. He said, December 1st, the, ro the rabbi of his school, the principal, comes over to him and he hands him an envelope. He opens up, it's $1,000 cash. He says, what's this? He says, I'm giving this to you. Did somebody call you last night? Nobody called. What are you giving it to me for? He said, there's a boy in our school, he's seven years old. He still can't read, and his father doesn't know what to do with him. Tutors are not helping. Nothing is helping this boy. He came to me last night and he said, I want you to give this to a rabbi who could use it and tell him to pray for my son. And he has the name of the boy on the envelope. And he said, so why giving it to me? He says, because I know you're a holy man. You're going to pray well. I decided to give it to you. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. There's a thousand on the first day. He says, I have it. I don't want to get too cocky. He says, I know I have the Tahon Hashem. 
He said, so then his rabbi was telling you know, do you have any time during the week? Because he started learning, he said, December 1st, he started learning at night, two hours. He said it was great. He was learning the whole time. He got back into it. He said it was like an Eden. He said, though, his rabbi told him, if you have any other time free, you have to do, make a hishtadullah. He said, I have no other time. The only time I have during the week free is Sunday morning. He says, okay. So let's try to get you tutoring jobs on Sunday morning. So he says, okay. If that's the way Hashem's going to send me the money, I'll do that. They tried to get tutoring jobs for him. Nobody wanted He got one boy $50 for, for her an hour. It's not going to do that much. 200 for the month. He says, okay. I'll have Hashem, don't worry. He said, so it's now December 28th. I forgot what day it was. It was a Thursday. He said, it was dry the whole month. I need another thousand dollars. He says, I guess maybe I didn't have Bita. Hashem didn't come through. We're almost at January 1st. He says, but I really feel so connected to Hashem. It can't be. He said, you know what it could be? Maybe my Torah is not being accepted by Hashem. He says, for the next three prayers, I pray to Hashem, please accept my Torah. Accept my learning. I want to learn so badly. Please accept my Torah and help me pay my bill. He said, he prayed his, 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 his heart out. He said, now it's the last Friday in December, then it's January 1st, the hot banks are closed, everything. He's got to come up with the money now. The final Friday, he gets home from, from the school, Friday afternoon. He's saying, Hashem, where's the money going to come? Anyway, he's opening his mail. He sees uh, something from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. He opens it up and he starts reading. It says we were involved in a lawsuit over taxes or something for the last 30 years. We finally won the case and we made a ton of money, whatever we got from all those money. And as a one-time courtesy, we're sharing it with our customers. He looks at a check, $500 for him, $500 for his wife. He takes a picture of it, he sends it to me, he says, look, he came through on the last day. I got by January. So he pays the rent. He says, I know how to be tough one. So this following Shabbat in my shul, I said, it's a gorgeous story. This guy, you know, he has a Muna, Hashem comes through. So I tell the story to my congregation. So I said, this boy, you know, he has a Muna. So after the shiur, a man comes over to me and says, I want to share in his learning. Can I donate $500? I said, oh, great. Of course. Someone else comes over to me. Can I give him $250? I got a thousand. I wasn't even making a drive. I got $1,000 on January 4th. I called up the guy after Shabbat. I said, I started you off for January. <laughs> she be checking. Hashem is amazing. So now, February 3rd, I text him. I said, how January go? He said, Rabbi, I'm good. I said, I'm in. I said, what happened? He said, the story's not so great. I said, what happened? He said, someone gave me an idea to start a boys' youth club on Sunday mornings instead of tutoring for the boys not in school. He said, I'm making double now. Of what I was making at night, I'm getting 3000 instead of 1500 for the Sunday mornings. I don't have a problem anymore. I said, amazing. Hashem gave you a different job. He's letting you learn at night. He had bitachon, he had a murah. And he had shalom by it. Because they together went and they asked. And these are some of the things that we need to remember. We need to remember, you got the right one. You have the right partner. You have a mitzvah, great mitzvah, to work on your relationship. It's never too late. 
A couple once, a rabbi was once giving a lecture on Shalom Bayim. He told, he was, I was in the class. See, he said there was an older couple. All the children were out of the house. And they're just looking at each other all day with nothing to do. And the, the man said, my wife told me, she said, you know, we really don't have anything in common. You know, I, I had enough. He says, what are you talking about? He says, I want to go separate ways. You know, the kids are all married, everything. He said, I can't believe it. He went to his rabbi. He said, rabbi, what should I do? I don't want to get divorced. He said, have you been complimenting her? He says, I don't know. He says, you're not complimenting her enough. That's your problem. He says, every night I want you by dinner to think of something new to compliment her on. He said, okay. The next night at dinner, he says, did I ever tell you what a good cook you are? She says, no. He says, you're the best. Really? The next night, same. He says, you know, and he starts listening. The next night, he gets, he's, every night he says things. He says, you know, my socks in my drawer, they're always folded so perfectly. You're the best sock folder. <laughs> she said, oh. The lady ended up telling someone, she says, I can't wait for dinner at night now. I, I can't wait to hear what he's going to say. <laughs> and he saved the marriage. You can always work on it. It's never too late. It's a mitzvah. Hashem should give us the siyata dishmaya to have happy marriages for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren. Bezrat Hashem, we should bring the Mashiach soon. Amen. The rabbi is ready for the next invitation, sir. Bezrat Hashem. And perhaps we can organize a Midian for our feet. So we have volunteers for our feet who did not pray yet. Okay, I think we're going to have a Midian. Otherwise, there are refreshments in the breakfast room. Amen, amen.